Well, let's get started. So for the people live and the people listening afterward, the people live, there's gonna be a link in the uh, in the chat for a special um, European friendly demand gen live happening on Thursday, June 17th at 12 p.m. Eastern, I believe. Maybe we moved it to 12.30. I'm not sure. We'll confirm that and let you know. 12.30. Okay, 12.30 it is. 12.30 on Thursday, June 17th. All the people in the UK and the EU that have been dropping comments on the link on the LinkedIn post saying, hey, can you do a European friendly time? Here it is. Um, and based on the amount of European attendance and US attendance for that matter, we'll think about doing it more frequently. And so if you'd like a time slot on a recurring basis somewhere in that neighborhood, then I'd encourage you to attend so that it gives us feedback to continue to do it. And perhaps we'll have a second installment of Demand Gen Live Weekly on Thursday around that time. We'll see, time will only tell. The audience, the audience tells the story, you all tell the story here. Okay, so getting into the agenda here, I'm actually gonna come, come out with a topic that was not on the agenda, but we've been going back and forth on some LinkedIn comments and I think that it's interesting. It's sort of um, kind of like going back to basics, but it's interesting that we've covered, I mean, people have been here for a while, we've covered a lot on this podcast and sometimes it helps to sort of like go back a little bit and re rethink or recommunicate a topic that somebody may not have gotten that we covered in June of last year or something. And so that's what we're gonna go for here. And the topic is, is in ungating content. And so I'm seeing a lot of people right now that are doing something along the lines of saying, like, I get it, Chris, or I get it, whoever, because a lot of people is talking about it. Everyone now is ungating content. So all I'm gonna do is just remove the forms from my website and let people access the content. And what I'm here to tell you is that ungating content is not enough on its own. The reason to ungate content is because you've already changed your metrics and ungating the content allows you to update your content strategy and make it more customer focused and adjust your distribution strategy because you don't need to collect email addresses so you can put it in places where people actually are. And so that's sort of like the wrapping around why ungating content works. It's a, it's a tactic that's driven through a larger strategic, um, a larger strategic change, which is that we don't, we want our buyers to have the information. We want to be able to distribute it where they are. And we are not measuring on the amount of form fills for people that downloaded our content. So we don't need this anymore. And so um, that wraps into a larger topic that I'll start to dive into too. Um, sort of another misconception here on when we talk about adjusting your marketing metrics from, and a lot of companies are doing this right now, moving from leads or MQLs to qualified pipeline, however they define it on their own. I see a lot of companies defining it as SQL or, you know, meeting booked, which is not qualified pipeline in my mind. But anyway, adjusting the metric to pipeline and then doing all the same shit that they normally do not changing anything else, just changing the metric. And so the reason to change your metric from MQLs to qualified pipeline is so that you can change you can change other behaviors, so that you can change your strategy, so that you can change your tactics, so that you can adjust how you advertise, how you can adjust how you collect contacts, you can adjust what you optimize for. That is the reason to change the metric because it allows everything else downstream to change. You can't make a lot of the changes that we talk about here if your team is scored on a high volume of MQLs that converted a really low, low rate. And so those are two quick things that were not on the agenda that I just wanted to get in there real quick. And so um, maybe it sparked a couple of questions for later, but we're gonna keep rolling right now. So um, the next one we're gonna talk about here, and this is again, sort of like something that we covered early on, I can remember Gatano and I talking about this for a long time, and I just wanna, sort of bring it back because I feel like these topics are misunderstood. I also feel like the way that uh, the way that I define some topics is quite different than how other people define words. And so we'll kind of go through it here on the topic of performance marketing versus brand marketing. I think there's a lot of confusion here in the market about what these two things mean. Performance marketing, some people means paid ads or lead gen, or we want to, or direct response or different things like that. And brand marketing for some people means building a trade show booth or um, doing a lot of things that are like that, like higher funnel, fluffy, difficult to measure, or they just don't want to admit that it's not working anymore. And so the real way that I look at this is, is that it's all about your mindset. 
you can be doing almost the exact same thing in a channel and it can be brand marketing or performance marketing depending on your mindset your intent your goals and then how you actually execute on it and so i'll give a couple of examples we run on paid social probably at least 90 percent but approaching converging on a hundred percent brand marketing because our intent and our metrics do not align with 100% performance-based things. I do not need direct attribution for a lead. My objective is not to collect as many leads as possible. I am not optimizing at cost per lead. My intent is to educate people so they understand more about the product, the narrative, the category, different things or other things that can be related to the product or service that we're offering so that they consider us in the future. That's not to say that we don't measure it to something like sales. We just measure it in a different way that people are, aren't accustomed to, and we're not looking for that action to happen right now. And so that's something that people might wanna think about because if you can flip your mind on, okay, like we don't need to run lead gen or different things like that. You're, you could almost pivot to performance marketing straight away by just adjusting your measurement and what you're actually trying to accomplish and how you're reporting on it. And maybe that's the, the explanation that some people need to understand what we're doing. We're still getting measured on how much revenue gets brought in, which is how all marketing should ultimately be measured, but with or without direct attribution and within a specific time window overall, if we're doing something in marketing, we should, we should know that it's either helping buyers build affinity to our brand or driving direct sales or different things like that, all of which contribute to some future growth of the company through word of mouth or revenue or relationships or different things like that. And so that is the sort of like the, the overview of how I see the differences between brand marketing and performance marketing. You could almost look at it in this case from just lead gen versus demand gen. It's a pretty easy comparison here, right? Performance marketing, I need to get leads. I need direct attribution, all those different things demand generation, I want to create demand for the product by educating and informing buyers in the places where they are, so that when they have a need that we might be able to solve, they consider us first and they come to us ready to buy. And so those are the, the nuances between those two things. I think that brand marketing in for a lot of people has gotten a poor stigma because of what executives think about brand over this past marketing automation math performance marketing era where brand marketing typically is what ex where executives push things that they still choose to do and spend a lot of money on are not able to measure it or they can measure it and it's not working very well or there's terrible roi but they still want to call it brand so that they can keep justifying doing it and so there's a new way to do brand marketing which involves executing in channels where people are distributing that content it's not a trade show booth it's not different things like that that i think people should really consider it's working very well for us in both paid and organic channels and the key is that it's your mindset until you adjust them your mindset about what you're trying to accomplish how you're going to measure and what you're actually trying to to do with your prospects or buyers or however you want to frame them up you won't be able to get over the hump to get to this space where you can do this. And so um, hit three topics pretty quick. I will pause there and see where we're at. We do have a few questions. Um, I'll also have you just check your mic, see if it's on. We're hearing a bit of an echo. Don't know if it's coming from, if you're plugged in your computer audio. Um, but we we heard you well, but for the rest of the show, you can double check. We got some good questions though. I appreciate you. I'm sure this is much better, huh? Yes, there you go. Jeez. There you go. I told you guys I'd fix yeah, it. Yeah, why is Zoom doing that? Okay, thank you all. Appreciate Sound you. Great. Sound great. So we actually, a few people needed some clarification, um, and then I'll bring Elaine on next because I really liked her question. I want to give her a chance to ask it, but can you clarify what you consider qualified pipeline if it's not a booked meeting? Is it you know qualification post the initial meeting? A few people had that same question, so mm -hmm. can you just clarify your point on that? Qualified pipeline to me is an opportunity that has 
sat on a meeting with an AE, the AE considers it qualified, there's still an opportunity open with an amount attached to it, and you win those opportunities at greater than 20%. And that's what I consider a uh, considered qualified pipeline, which is a much more strict definition than what most companies use, which is why they're able to celebrate generating $20 million in pipeline and not a lot of in, in revenue. And so, because a lot of stuff gets lost between booking a meeting and what I just said. And so the later funnel that you can go as a marketer, it gives you actually way more flexibility to do good marketing. I like going later funnel because it's hard to get buyers that far. And so and then you can move more into demand gen and far, farther away from lead gen. It also shows the impact much greater. It's awesome to go and start with a company that's getting 13 sales qualified opportunities every month through their website because all they're doing is running performance marketing and generating bad leads. And then you just adjust that. And over a six month period of time, then they're getting 40 with less, way less leads than they were generating before. And so, but if you didn't move to a later funnel metric and you were always scored on a high volume of leads, you would always have to spend all of your money and all your time to hit the lead number and never be able to explore ways to increase the, the qualified pipeline amount. And so, that's the way that, that I look at it. I think it's a really strong um, definition with a lot of different components, which is the AEs talk to them. The opportunity, the opportunity is still open. So AE qualified pipeline is different than S in SDR pipeline. The reason why the SDR is comped on booking that meeting. That's their goal. The AE's goal is to close the, close the deal. So a, talk to the AE, the AE still has the opportunity open. And from that stage forward, on average, you win those at at least 20%. So therefore, you can forecast accurately um, from there and project out projected CAC and, and forecast revenue. There's still benefit in tracking earlier leading metrics, right? You just 100%. don't want to necessarily anchor on them. We're looking at every how things flow through every stage to find places where you can optimize or inefficiencies or you can back in from different lead sources and be like, this is how I figured all this stuff out, right? Like, you run, how did I know that everything that falls off between the SDR booking the meeting and the AE actually sitting in the meeting is because I've done it before, right? And then you just experience that. And the reason is because the SDR is incentivized to get someone into that meeting and that is their goal. And as a marketer, if you're running heavy performance marketing to get low intent leads, an SDR can do things to get someone to sit on that meeting but all of them fall off because they don't have enough buying intent to complete an enterprise sales process. And the AE doesn't want to pursue it because it, it's just a you know very low percentage opportunity to win. And that's why you see that drop off there. And so, and again, why I challenge marketers to go later funnel because it, it really, really shows one, that the stuff is working. So you have validated that your funnel is clean. And we have companies that we've been working with for 18 months where that SQO win rate stays between 25 and 28% for 15 months. And so consistent win rates mean that you have a clean funnel, mean that you have a good process, mean that if you put more in, you should expect to see the same percentage conferred out over time as long as you're running the same mix and you're not injecting bad leads through that process. And it allows you to forecast out to, to go back to executives to say, look, we generated 60 sales qualified opportunities last month, we're winning those at 30%. We're going to win 20 deals at 50K ARR that we created in pipeline. That's a million dollars in revenue that we created this month in pipeline is what we're projecting out. We spent a hundred grand. We need to keep investing more in marketing. And so that's how you, you take that type of data rooted in a clean revenue operations look or a clean, clean revenue operations system and then go have an educated conversation with executives and make a business case to scale marketing further. Awesome. Elaine had a good question um, related to Facebook and some of your opening comments. Elaine, I will bring you on to ask your question live. Yeah. Hello. Good hey, Elaine. Hi. Okay, so my question is um, that I've been taught by performance marketers to on Facebook ads to always um, optimize for conversions because then you are more likely to get the kind of people who will buy. And so um, if we don't 
you know, try to do that. If we don't try to drive for conversions with our creative and all that, I'm wondering what you optimize for when you're doing brand marketing, like what you would recommend optimizing for. Is it views? Is it click throughs? Mm -hmm. what, are, what are you doing? Yeah. And, and so to be clear in Facebook, when you optimize for conversions, you're not optimizing for the people that are most likely to buy. You're optimizing for the people that are most likely to be a lead for you. And that's really the difference. I've done this enough with a variety of companies and analyzed data across 50 companies that do stuff like this. And not only on Facebook, on LinkedIn and other channels as well. It has, it's not about the channel. It's about how it's being used and how it doesn't align with how buyers buy, make complex buying decisions with multiple stakeholders with an enterprise sales motion. And so you can run conversion-based stuff. Plenty of companies do it. They get a lot of leads. The leads are cheap. The data is is bad unless you have a robust enrichment system and they within a couple thousand dollars say that Facebook is not a good channel for them because they used it in the wrong way and collected shitty leads. And so um, what we optimize for on Facebook and the, the reason that we use it, well, let me start with the, the reason that we use it. <sighs> Facebook and Instagram combined have by far the most scale of B2B attention on the internet. It's not even close. You can compare the audience data between or the reach data between um, Facebook and Instagram feed and story only, not display network where you get a bunch of reach and impressions that don't don't make a big impact. Just in the feed and the story on LinkedIn or Instagram and Facebook and compare that against the same reach that you get on LinkedIn and it's going to be dramatically different. You're not going to hit nearly as many people on LinkedIn as you would on Facebook because just flat out more people use those two platforms combined. So one, you get more scale. Two, the prices of the ads are significantly cheaper than, than LinkedIn, although we're finding ways to make them more comparable on LinkedIn, but regardless, they're still cheaper. Um, three, you have a lot more creative flexibility than LinkedIn where you just have the feed. On Instagram, you have a story, you have 15 second view, you can do a lot, you can do a lot more creative things inside of Facebook and Instagram than you can on LinkedIn, at least at the moment, because the LinkedIn ad product is just not very mature and innovate slowly. Um, and so what we're, the, there's a bunch of different variety of things that we're doing on, on Facebook and Instagram ads. I'll run through a couple. One is the, the standard, like we're going to run content, product marketing to a product page, social proof to an ungated case study, um, blog that highlights a pain point that somebody didn't know they had, video of something communicating the strategic narrative of the company or old way versus new way or different things like that. There's a million different things that you can communicate that tells a story in the feed and drive someone to a landing page that has more detail. And then you can measure the engagement on that landing page at the account level, how long, how long they stayed for, how long they scrolled, a bunch of different things like that. And then you can use custom conversions, which worked a lot better six months ago than they do now because of iOS 14. But up to that point, we could know that somebody saw the ad on Facebook that didn't click on it, just saw it and then went to our website within 28 days and converted on a demo. And we knew that the ad did, did that. And we knew that we weren't retargeting them and they were cold and we moved them through a process to consider buying. And then as we did that more and more, more people went and did that action and converted to qualified pipeline likely to find earlier in this episode and everything was great. And so the key here is to understand who's giving you this advice, because there are places where running based on conversions or different things like that makes sense. It can make sense in, in product led if you can convert people on mobile into your SaaS tool, it can make sense that way. It definitely works in e-com because you have direct transaction revenue. And the challenge with why it doesn't work in enterprise SaaS is because you have a sales motion that creates a lot of friction and people are, don't understand what they're signing up for typically when they convert on that form and they're not going to continue the process at a rate that makes enough sense to justify it based on the win rates and the customer acquisition cost in my experience. And so um, landing page objective, we, went, we leaned into just using the reach objective for a while as a supplement to all the work that we're doing on LinkedIn. And so reach objective, we're hitting high value, you know, high seniority, high value accounts on LinkedIn. We're getting more scale throughout that on Facebook. When you optimize for reach versus landing page, your click-through rates go way down. Your overall reach goes significantly up, which has benefits to use in, in some situations there. Um, 
And those are the two main ones that we use. If we're going to do a webinar campaign, um, occasionally, if we have like some type of guide that the company wants to gate, like you can obviously use a conversion-based objective on that product led conversion. You can do that as well. Um, I just don't, I haven't seen one instance of it working at a rate that makes sense with a sales motion and enterprise SaaS when measured against revenue and customer acquisition costs. Wow. That was a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to help. Do you have a follow-up? Well, okay. After you do that, then do you automatically re retarget or only in some instances? Mm, we use, we use retargeting um, to continuously build an audience that is quote unquote warm. That's been to the website before, whether they came from paid or whether they came organically or through a different version, it just helps you build an audience of people that are warmer but in retargeting as well, in the common like e-com funnel or different things like that, that people are building to sell a $99 course that's now somehow being translated into enterprise SaaS for 100K ACV software is that you would get people to your website and then you would retarget them with a mid-funnel offer. And the people that clicked on that, you'd retarget with a demo form. Um, and I've done that testing enough to know that one, you're going to get just as many leads if you just do the demo and forget the funnel. And the second part is that the win rates, again, are not going to be high enough. And so we use retargeting, um, but mainly just to build a warm audience. And then we have, you know, different campaigns for them, but it's not, again, not generally conversion based. Okay. And last is um, um, after you're retargeting, um, do you build a lookalike audience, thumbs up or thumbs down? Um for the most part, thumbs down. Um, there's some instances where it can be beneficial. I like using the, um, in the ad set, you can turn on audience expansion um, on link click ads and some other different formats, um, which will give you some part of the Facebook algorithm and proprietary intent data that will go out and find new people based on their behavior across the internet and all the stuff that Facebook knows about them to present your ad because they think that you'd be likely to do whatever the, they'd be likely to do whatever the objective is. And so I like using that one instead because it's not as wide. There are some instances, if you're selling an Asana or a product led thing, that's very wide and can go to a, you know, millions of potential people or millions of potential accounts, then it's worth testing. Um, but generally like what I see is companies that can only sell to the fortune 1000 that are building lookalike audiences inside of Facebook for, for yeah. no, for no reason. Um, and there's a million iterations of that, right? So if you have company firmograph strict company firmographic requirements, um, if you just generally have a small total addressable, if you have a very narrow buyer, um, profile of the person that's actually going to buy, there's a, a ton of reasons why not to use lookalike audiences in B2B. It's, it's for the most part, um, pretty wasteful. I've done it myself quite a bit. And I think there are some, um, I, I think there are quite some use cases where it makes sense, but, um, for the most part, I think it's something that I would only consider if I had really strong audiences, a good data source for the look like there was a large total addressable and the company was spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a month on the channel. Makes sense. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Elaine. That Great questions. Yeah. Back and forth. Um, so my friend Paul is um, across the pond. It's 2 a.m. He's laying in bed. Let's do a little demand gen <laughs> inception here right now. Okay. So a question around, um, you mentioned at, in one of your, in your opening segment about having um, AEs qualify the initial leads. And he's asking, what about the, the SDR? So tell him a Sorry. little story. Like when should a lead be handed off to the SDR versus AE? He's basically, can you clarify, like, should the SDR ever get the lead? Are you saying it should always go to the AE? Um, the, the first couple of points you were making, you were talking about AE sourced or uh, AE, AE qualified. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And so um, let me see, how am I going to start with this? Um the first thing is it depends on your, it depends on your marketing model. It depends on your, uh, frankly, it depends on your go to market model. And so, um, for companies that are generating a high volume of low intent leads, AKA running lead gen, getting measured on MQLs and pushing a bunch of people through a demand waterfall 
from 2007 into SDRs to do teleprospecting, you're going to need to pass those to SDRs because AEs are not going to follow up with them because the majority of them are garbage and don't want to buy. And so you, you need to go through the SDR layer if you, if you do that, which is what most companies do. If you shift to only focusing your, your marketing funnel on high intent leads that ask to talk to a sales rep that are interested in purchasing, purchasing something and are firmographically qualified to buy based on demographics and account firmographics, then you can give those directly to an account executive. The ideal model is that they're able to book a meeting with their rep that's going to finish the sale all the way through. And so there's a couple different nuances here. And the, and the reason why to give it directly to the rep, and I've done this experiment at several companies as an employee. And so the experiment is we have a, an amount of data from at least six months. We're sending, we're generating high intent leads. We're giving them directly to account executives and we're able to measure the success of that funnel over the course of time. We start generating so many high intent leads that the company is concerned on follow-up time. And they're concerned on follow-up time. The reason is because somebody in 2011 published a report that you need to follow up with a lead in five minutes. And the people who published that report was an outsourced SDR firm that obviously has a vested interest in you, you know, following up fast so that you consider using them. But anyway, so they were, cons they were concerned about the reps not following up in time. And so they wanted to send them to SDRs. And so we, we stopped sending them to AEs and they started, st started going to SDRs solely for the follow-up time and to book the meeting. And here's what happened in the data of the experiment. The conversion rate to the meeting was the same between the two groups. We got the, we got the same percentage of people that asked for, to talk to a sales rep and get a demo to actually book the meeting. But the win rates of those deals all the way through were significantly higher with the opportunities that went directly to the AEs. The reason that that happened is because the first call went dramatically better. The AE has a better understanding of that person, is able to dig into pain, to do a brief discovery, to book a meeting, to build rapport, and to continue to move that through a process versus somebody basically getting called by an assistant, getting qualified, aka just getting a bunch of questions to deem whether or not they're worth talking to when they clearly are worth talking to, because we have enough data now with all the you know, data tools to say, look, this person's a CMO at a company that we want to sell to based on their, their firmographics. Why do we need someone to ask them BANT questions when we have all of this information to do it anyway? And so I feel pretty strongly on this from just overall business outcome. The win rates are going to be higher. Um, from a buyer experience standpoint, it's going to definitely be a better buying experience. Three, if you, make, if you make this move, the amount of people that are going to convert from the demo, the demo submission or whatever contact sales submission into the actual meeting is going to be 80 plus percent. And so you don't need to have an SDR chasing a bunch of people around to try and get a meeting when they're going to convert at such a high rate. And so for all of those reasons, I believe that if you decide to move to this model, which is high intent, firmographically qualified accounts or leads, however you want to look at it, get sent directly to AEs. I just think it's a, it's a better model for everyone. Yeah, the SDR model often was just for the benefit of the company and efficiency without even thinking about what the buying experience would be like. And I think that holds true today. Totally. And it was a, it was a different game when that stuff got put together. Stuff got put together before like Twitter was around. Yeah, like 20 years and ago. Now we're still doing it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. um, I have a couple questions that were submitted in advance, but do you want to meander back to the agenda and grab another point? How, where, where are you feeling? Mm, let's go topic? one more. Let's go one more question. All right. All right. Well, um, I don't think he's on yet. Carl sent in a fun question in advance that I'm also curious what you think about this. He wanted to know what you think about the new iOS 15 email feature, um, where it's basically um, you can hide your email. So it lets you provide a deletable dummy email address on the web that will forward email to your actual account. So you don't have to like give up your actual email for it. Have you heard of this? 
Mm, I've I've heard about it. I can like, you know, just brainstorm about it, but I don't have a clear, um, I don't have a clear, fully formed opinion on it. And so, um, the first thing is whether or not like you use a masked email through Safari. There's a database out there that has everybody's email. Your email is somewhere and somebody can go and get it if they want. And so I get that this is in pursuit of privacy driven by Apple and other um, other technology vendors that support these things. But you go on to Zoom Info or 10 of the other providers of data and source my email or your email, Carl, or any uh, most other B2B people through one of those places. And so I think it's a... I think it helps from a, you know, PR standpoint for what Apple is doing. And I'm not here to say whether it's a good thing or a bad thing that they're doing it. I just think it's the way that it is. Um, and so I actually don't, I don't see a ton of potential like impacts here, at least in the first pass. And so um, some things that, uh, that people could consider about this is all the people that come and tell me that LinkedIn is not an own channel, it's a rented channel because LinkedIn can turn stuff off whenever, blah, 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 and go back and say, well, Apple can hide people's email addresses or people can give you fake email addresses or people can unsubscribe or they can go into spam filters or all the other things that are gonna happen through email, even though you think that you own the channel. And so um, I, I don't see a, you know, generally I think that email is, is a, is an okay channel. I think it's worthwhile for people to use. It's, I think when used in the right way, it can, it can work, but um, I don't have a lot more to say about this one. Got it. Sounds like it's just to appease people, but isn't actually going to change anything. Mm. We'll see. We'll see what happens. That's what I, it's kind of what I got off the top of my head on that one. Cool. Right. SEO. Moving on. Let's battle. Prepare for the people that are going to come on and debate me afterwards. I know that people already sent me emails about it. I know people are already in the chat about it. What people need to see in this agenda topic is why you don't need SEO in 2021. And what my position is, is that you don't need it. I'm not saying that you don't, you shouldn't have it. I'm not saying that you shouldn't consider doing it. I'm trying to communicate a fact that most people think that you need to do it. And I'm going to present a position with the, with some data about why you might not need it and why your belief about SEO might want, you might want to question it considered against other things. And so here's the black and white data. And we're going to continue on this experiment at Refine Labs for a very long time. We started the company two, two years ago. We hired our first employee about 18, you know, eight, 18, 20 months ago. We've spent zero effort on SEO. Even our title tags are not good. Like ba the basics are not good. Zero effort and have grown rapidly. So to a place, and it's going to continue to scale up and we will continue to report back on the progress because I'm interested in showing people that there is an alternative way that if you went in a different direction, then you might be actually able to get faster growth. And so the thing to consider here, which I think is ultra interesting, is that in SEO, you are capturing demand. People need to go, it's reactive. People need to go in there and search. They need to make the search. You have no targeting to whether or not they're qualified except based on the search intent versus if you're going out and creating demand and communicating your message to people in the places that they are, you might be able to get a bigger impact. We're experiencing that in a huge way and you might be able to build on that in a long way. And again, I think, I believe that in SEO, you are competing against other people. Christopher Lockhead talks about this a lot in Play Bigger. I think in SEO, you're competing with people. And I think in creating demand, you're leading, you're leading the way in a new space. And so 
you know, rapid growth will continue to report back um, on the impact of not, I'm not saying like I, I said at the beginning, I'm going to continue to clarify. It's not that everyone shouldn't do SEO. I'm telling people that you should consider something else because I know in my heart that if we, if we used SEO as our primary strategy to build this company, instead of a podcast and LinkedIn, we would not have the customers we would have. We do not, we would not have the brand that we have. We would not have the growth that we would have, and we would not have the employees and the talent that we have. And so that's just something to consider in terms of what is your primary strategy in 2021. Um, we're going, like I said, we're going to continue down the path to basically prove to companies that you can build a substantial hyper growth company without doing a single second of SEO. Are there any types of companies, industries, or scenarios when you do think it would be a go-to strategy just to play devil's advocate? The answer can be no. <laughs> um, it, what I'm, what I'm thinking, what I'm trying to f figure out in my head is if there are instances where there's the, the amount of search volume, but I, I really can't figure it out, be, or I really can't figure out a place where it would be the best primary strategy because you're going to be an SEO. And this is maybe, let me, I don't even think that would work. I was going to say if you're the category leader, but even then I don't think it would be the right approach. No matter what, if you're a company and your primary strategy is an SEO, you're going to be competing against another company that is considered the category leader who's going to have a major leg up on you. And so, or you're going to be, if you're in the position of creating a category, you're going to have very little search volume and struggle to do that. And so my suggestion would be to create demand, <laughs> create demand in every situation. And I, again, I just think that the way that people research and discover products, we've talked, we talk about this a ton on the podcast. It's just different. Um, another thing to think about for people, and I mentioned this one a lot too, but I just want to hammer this topic home so everyone gets it, is that I understand that your marketing automation or your visible system tags it as organic search when you look at revenue contribution, but that is not what caused most of that revenue. And so this is an attribution facade for people, for SEO marketers, that's self-fulfilling prophecy for a very long time. And I have enough companies that have been working on SEO that eventually hits a ceiling somewhere at the eight to $10 million in revenue range, or potentially even before that, because you need to go out and create demand and build a brand. I like attribution facade. That's a nice phrase. Mm -hmm. um, Samantha had a good question, asked me to ask on her behalf. Um, she's with you on uh, what you're talking about with SEO. She's here for that mindset. Um, but you, your example in describing Refine Labs was building a completely new company from scratch. How, how would you relay this message to a, maybe a more established company? D does your recommendation change or anything come into play? Yeah, I think the recommend, recommendation does change. As a, at, a, at a big company that's already doing this, you should not, you should not just pivot and stop. Um, because what you're going to want to do is you're, you're probably going to want to keep SEO going. And then you need to be focusing efforts on creating the infrastructure and talent and organizational understanding about how to build on other channels and actually create demand. And so I think that is the, um, I think that it's from our seat in a different place. We built it from the ground up because I knew that it would work better. For other companies that are already existing, you're going to need to figure out how to make it work for you, make a create demand strategy work for you before you stop doing any of the things that you're doing right now. Lisa asks, do you think it's possible to create demand with SEO by reaching, hitting people higher up in the funnel? No. Come up. And then do you have a perspective on how big or small your total addressable market is? Um, Dave was mentioning if your TAM is small, SEOs can be kind of useless. Mm. 
Yeah, I think Tam impacts it some. Like um, search volume would probably be a different way to look at it. And some SEO marketers love to optimize for the terms that have the highest search volume, not the terms that have anything near level of buying intent that would make sense to target. And so, um, yeah, there's some impact on Tam, but I don't think it. I don't. I don't think it changes that much. Like our our Tam based on our ICP is somewhere between ten thousand and twenty thousand accounts, which is not that much. Um, and, but it's still a decent amount and a create just generally because of how buyers buy and where we are in terms of the in information distribution on the internet. I just feel like a create demand strategy with a narrative and well thought out message to the market that people like is the winning formula right now. All right, that was a good little SEO segment right there. Yeah, while I drum we'll, up some more. We'll questions. wait for Gatano to get back on here, and we can <laughs> we'll debate it at some point. Maybe we'll get him on a webinar. Him and uh, that would be fun. Actually, we'll do that. Gatano is coming to Boston um, in three weeks from now, and we're going to do a live podcast from the studio that should be ready next week. And we will I'll include that in the topic that we'll debate that one. I feel like Gatano might actually be able to rap too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to hit the last agenda topic while I uh, get some more questions? Yeah, let's source some more questions. I can probably source some topics on my own because I got a lot of stuff going on in my brain right now, but we'll continue on the agenda. And so what the next part of the agenda is, is how top marketers stay ahead and capitalize on new opportunities, right? And so if we, if we think about, um, here, here's a really interesting way to, to think about this that I hadn't thought of before, is we'll look at the, the journey that I've taken over the past, I don't know, eight, eight to 10 years in marketing of the channel that I was using that I thought worked the best at that exact time. It's not to say that other channels don't work. I'm just saying which one worked the best for me at that time. And so in 2013, and I'm going to stay B2B only, not because I did some B2B2C stuff back in the day. I'm going to say B2B only for this one. In 2013 to 15, it was definitely SEO. In 2016, it was marketing automation, email marketing. In 2017 and 18, it was Facebook ads. In 2019, it was LinkedIn organic. And in 2020, it was a podcast. And so it's interesting to think about that progression, right? Because a lot of marketers thinking of, I, I would encourage people that I just went through that, that have been in the game for a little while to think about what your progression has been. Because if you've been in the game for six years and you're still doing the same stuff that you did in year one, then you might want to look at how am I able to continue to evolve as buyers adjust and new opportunities open and dynamics change over the internet or physical or whatever. And so the reason that I've been able to make those changes is because I'm not married to any individual channel. I listen to customers intently. I optimize for revenue, not leads. And I'm deep in the details, in the qualitative insights inside of channels that give me insights that 99.99% of B2B companies and executives and marketers never see. Spending time in the comments, running crazy different things on LinkedIn organic to understand just what would happen. The only other person that I know that's posted eight times a day is Josh Braun. I would post it eight times a day just to see what would happen. Hint, it wasn't a good move, but I, was, I wanted to see that for myself, right? A lot of marketers would not do that. And when you do it every day, when you're running experiments, when you're listening, to, when you're reading 100 comments, when you're getting 30 DMs, when we're on here and we're getting a bunch of questions, when I'm talking to a bunch of pe people that actually do marketing across a lot of companies, I get deep insights which then allow me to, to see, okay, like a lot, I saw this a while ago, a lot of people are moving into getting information and asking questions about what to buy in revenue collective or communities. I was, the reason that I saw that is because I look in the community and I see what's going on that a lot of other people may not see. 
I see the comments. And so the take home here is to be very deep in the details and to be very close to your customer. The only reason that I decided that I figured out to run Facebook and Instagram in 2017 ads to physicians was because I, when I was in the ER and the ICU with them and I saw what they were doing when they weren't taking care of patients, that's what they were doing. And that was the insight that I needed. I'd never run a B2B Facebook ad before that moment until I saw them doing that. And then I figured out that I'm going to do that. And so um, I just, this is a generalization, but it's something that I see across a lot of the market is that a lot of people that execute demand marketing or brand marketing are not close to the customer, never speak to them, whether it's digitally or anything like that. And the, the insights get, you glean the insights when you, when you follow where, where people are and you listen to what they're saying. And I think that's really the take home here. And then once you've seen those different patterns a couple of times, like when I wasn't running Facebook ads and then I started running them in 2017 and I saw how much they were working almost immediately that I, I kept going with it to the tune of a mil, you know, a million, more than a million dollars a year after we started to see that effect. The same thing that we did on LinkedIn. I saw one post that went from, I mean, had seven likes constantly. One post went for like 150 because somebody that had a big audience commented on one of my posts. And then we were pot committed to LinkedIn post every day for two years. And then on the podcast, right? Like we started to see the podcast work. We were doing one episode a week. We started to see it work and we went hard to three episodes a week. And we've been doing that for more than a year. And so it's about when it's part about being in the places to actually run the experiment, to get this, the aha. And the second thing is to know what the aha feels like, and then go really hard after that. And those are some of the key takeaways as I reflect on some of the things that I've figured out. I think something else that you do, and maybe it's, um, not explicit, but I think everything you said is spot on, on paying attention to the details, being close to your customer, but there's an element of also paying attention to the big picture and seeing how things are just shifting, how, how things are just changing, how people are consuming information differently, where everyone is going to get the information that they need. And maybe you're not explicitly thinking about it, but in all of the examples you gave, I think it's recognizing that, that a shift is happening and like, and not getting too caught up in tunnel vision or, or the details to be able to appreciate both the details and the big picture. Yeah, so look, like 100% and some other things, like I'd be lying to you right now if I told you that Facebook ads today work better or work as well as they did in 2017. They don't. They still work though, and they still work enough relative to how other people, other companies spend money and how they deploy resources that it's still one of the best places to spend money in marketing. And so I would challenge some of the people that think that SEO is, is the best to think about whether SEO works as well for them right now as it did, and a lot of people probably weren't doing it at this time, but as it would in 2009 or 2011 or 2013, it's definitely not. And so... It's not that you shouldn't do them, right? I still do Facebook ads. I recognize that it doesn't work as well, but it's that you need to recognize the things that work the best. And I think a lot of people get caught up in what worked for them in the past. They don't explore deeply enough anything enough in the future, which is where you end up with the uh, high amount of conversations that I had. I had another one today with a company spending $200,000 in Google ads and has been doing it for the past four to six years. And it's get, getting to a place where they have nothing else figured out. They don't know how to create content. They have no other channels. It's all paper lead, paper click. And it's getting to a place where they actually need to make a change because the channel's maturing. It's getting more competitive. The conversion rates are going down. Buyers are moving in a different direction and, and they just can't do it anymore. And so that's what you don't want to be. That's the place where you don't want to be as a marketer, whether for your comp the company you work for or for your career right? Like the person that was running Google ads in 2005 was probably getting paid more than the people that run Google ads right now, just because it was, it, it was like being a software engineer earlier, right? Like over time, people move into it and different things like that. And so by being able to be ahead in the new things, 
that actually work the best. I think it's just a, a, a smart place to be from a career standpoint. Um, if you're looking to be a consultant, if you're looking to be a CMO, if you're looking to do those things, like you want to come in with a modern playbook that's respect, that's respected or forward thinking across the industry that you've tested deeply and have confidence that it works and you have confidence in your skills to be able to keep seeing the path in the future about the things that you need to do next. Samantha had a nice question that might be good to tie this one up. Um, as you reflect on um, the last several years and, and um, sort of the, the progression, have you, have you come to any conclusions about any overall trends? You mentioned like staying close to your customer and, and following them, but any other conclusions? And maybe she didn't ask this directly, but I'll add on to it. You have all the shiny objects, right? You have Clubhouse and all of these things. And your instincts are good in, in that I think you know when to strike and when to ignore. I don't know if you have any final thoughts to address that. Mm. The trends that I'm seeing, and this was kind of a broad question, so I'll just answer it the way that first way that popped into my mind, um, is that the places where people get information to make buying decisions in B2B is fundamentally different. And it's continuing to accelerate given the like lockdown and quarantine and all the way forward. And we're not going backwards. I think if you sample, I sample qualitatively with executives, I execute marketing on our own and see the impact for our own business. We execute marketing for 30 SaaS companies and see the impact on their business. And what I'm seeing is that there are a lot of different channels and tactics that most marketers don't understand at all, never execute on, have no deep understanding of the details or the way to execute the way that we do that are making a big impact for all of these companies. The reason they don't is because they're working on the things that worked for them in the past. And so the way that people get information is the fundamental difference. And I believe that most people right now are making B2B buying decisions based on content, narrative, or word of mouth referrals through people. And I think that's the main difference. I think that people that people pass through Google to buy stuff once somebody's already told them or once they've already got bought in or once they already do things to do research and then actually buy. And that's that's sort of the um, the main difference that I see. And then you had an, another question that I definitely had something to answer, but I just I lost it. Um, I was asking about how you know when to sort of go all in on a new oh. versus ignore it using clubhouse is kind yeah, of yeah clubhouse is a great example we i yeah. never made an account never went in there didn't anything and the the reason is is purely experience and so the reason i didn't move on that one when other people did is a couple of things one they didn't allow recording at the beginning, which completely conflicts with our content strategy, because I know that the impact of the content that's recorded and distributed over the internet makes a dramatically bigger impact than the live session. That's an, in, if people are listening to this right now, that is a major insight that you could take and take action and get way better results. It is about the amplification of content that's recorded from the live event that makes the impact, not the live event. I see very few SaaS companies operating with that mindset. It's really the truth. And so Clubhouse didn't allow recording. I'm not, I don't want to sit on there and try and build an, build an audience on Clubhouse to only be able to interact with the people that decide that they are there live on that exact time, that they're free and that they stumble across my Clubhouse room or whatever you call it. So the no recording was a, was a huge one for me. The second major one is that, what was I going to say? The second one was that, um, geez, like audio, it was like the audio only. I know you made um, I, I think the audio, I think the audio only was kind of was weird, but that wasn't the place where I was going. What was I going to say? Um, oh, it was pattern recognition. And the pattern recognition is that there was a big, um, there was a big wave of people that moved into Snapchat to start using it. And then a bigger platform that had way more scale copied the feature of Snapchat, aka stories, Instagram, Facebook, and every other platform after that, which then sl dramatically slowed the growth of Snapchat. And all the people continued to use that feature on other platforms. And it was 
blatantly obvious that the same thing was going to happen in Clubhouse. And that that's the pattern that I saw. And I saw it as there's an audio room, the people that have the platforms that have way more scale will copy this feature quickly because it's going to get popular. Clubhouse audience growth will, will slow or decline and people will consume audio only if they decide if that's a format that people actually want to use from a human behavior standpoint, they will use it in a different, uh, a different platform like Twitter or LinkedIn or the other ones that eventually copy it. I'm glad I figured that one out. That was a little bit, I got caught for a minute there, but we, we figured it out. We did, we did. Um, ready for a few questions? Always. All right, Matthew, I'm gonna bring you on. Let me find you. Um, you good to ask your question live? Hey, yeah, happy to be here. Hey guys. Hey, hey, hey. what's up, man? Hey, um, quick uh, success story too. Just to let you know, uh, kind of using the playbook, we uh, in Q4, between Q4 and Q1 last year, we had 19 sourced uh, opportunities coming out of like maybe two or three the entire year before. So it's working. Uh, happy to nice. say. Nice. What What do you What part of the system do you think is working the best? Um, we uh, we trimmed away with a lot of. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to say it's unnecessary, but we took a programmatic approach, right? I, yeah. I said this earlier in the chat. So instead of focusing on SEO, we can debate this all night, but yeah, of course. Um, we looked at it top down and said we had a North Star. Uh, and I asked two questions What influences bigger deals? And um, what, uh, what can we do to accelerate uh, opportunities? And mm -hmm. everything is built around those two questions. So yeah. that worked. We had an event um, that just kind of really uh really contributed to that so uh it, it's it's going pretty well in terms of some of the events and and, and uh building a program but nice. my question was um happy to hear yeah, that by the way yeah thank Go you <laughs> um do you have um experience finding like a, a, a or or using a supplemental partner as a channel and what i mean by that is some like maybe a a, ser a service that supports each other or 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 kind of leveraging that, like more of a partner channel, more than like a, an influencer or, or something like that? Mm, I'm not positive I understand your question. And so if you're looking, if I have experience working, building up a partner program. Yeah. Um, so it's similar in my experience, but not exactly what you're saying, but in my previous past from 2012 to 2015, I worked at companies that sold hardware, expensive hardware. And those products typically get sold through distribution. And so the distributor is the one that's actually selling. You might have a direct consumer flow. You might have a, something that goes through distribution, which is 40 to 80% of revenue. And then you might have an OEM where you manufacture for a specific company, and then they put it into a larger different product. And so we did have what I would consider a distribution channel very similar to a partner network. They have they stocked our parts. They were responsible for selling them. We treated them as a B2B, you know, account. And so I, I would consider that a partner network. And so I'd be happy to answer a deeper question about my experience there and how it relates maybe to a SaaS model. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're in IT services. So cool. it's, a, it's a little bit more of a, I'd say a complex buying cycle and yeah. think more of the long, along the lines of, Hey, maybe some of the tools that we use or some of the, the people we have, you know, partners, we have some of those relationships building a, a program that's more marketing driven around that. So, so uh, Hey, you we take do agile those... coaching, you do IT services or we do IT services and, and kind of finding a, a, a partner that we can build programs with each other. What's the, way. what's the benefit for your customer of that? Uh, throughput, I'd say if they're already using the tool and they need the service or vice versa, they need the, they're using the service and they, they're looking for a tool to, that we recommend or something that we mm -hmm. recommend on a, on a regular basis. Yeah. Why not just go to those people and say, Hey, we recommend you all the time. Let's get together and talk about how we, what customers we have. A totally. Company. Yeah. And so, um, this is super common for a services company and a tech company to do. The services company is the one that's actually implementing the tool. 
and going to be using it on an ongoing basis. And they use the tool anyway, and they're going to recommend it anyway. And so they partner up with the technology vendor and say, hey, not, you know, most of our customers use your tool anyway. We're recommending it to new people. We would like 20% of um, ARR for bringing new customers and we're going to implement them. So you don't need CSMs to do that. And we're going to be responsible for retention and da, 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 da. And that's a very common thing that the tech vendor typically drives that through their partner program. The services company kind of just needs to play a part in that type of, of that type of system. And so, um, you know, I would say that's a very common, a very common model that's typically driven on, you're going to do it anyway and then trying to get a rev, additional rev share from it. Um, the challenge with some of those things, and I've watched uh, specifically IT services firms do this, is that they become a partner to a specific vendor. They grow to 10 million in revenue, and that, and that vendor is driving most of their business through implementation. And then that vendor decides they want to change their partner model or they want to change their business program and they go from 10 million to 3 million the next year and then they eventually go out of business. And so being depend, there's a difference between partnering and being dependent. And in a services firm, you never want to be dependent on a partner. Cool, thank you. Cool. Um, Nuam, do you want to come on and ask your question? I'm unmuting you. Okay. <laughs> hey, hey. Hi, Great to see you again. Yes, I'm back. <laughs> I, I, I listen to all the, the episodes when I can't make it, but I'm back <laughs> online. Um, I, yeah, I just dropped a question just uh, in the chat now because uh, some of the things you said around SEO and what's working I instead of B2B um, and, and where we should be I guess, spending our time. So mm. now that I've sort of got, uh, you know, an okay to grow my internal team, I'm getting sort of like a content specialist and and I want to do all of those things that we've been talking about, you know, creating a podcast, doing mm -hmm. content production, getting it all out there. Um, but I've also been talking to an agency because I wondered if there are some sort of growth tactics that we can still be uh, doing that um, because we're sort of still... Um, a little bit like we've got two two key segments mm -hmm. one I sort of know that you know it's all about word of mouth and that kind of thing the other one is the enterprise space which is I know content is going to be huge um getting a, 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 a agency on board should there is doesn't make sense to kind of use them more for um like maybe the SEO piece um maybe like the you know a couple of um paid campaigns that we haven't we haven't done that in-house before so mm -hmm getting them to sort of maybe focus on those things and, and we can see if they're working or not. That was kind of where I was gonna gonna go with it, but um, I'm not sure where, if I should be giving them SEO or if I should have someone who's a content specialist internally who you know knows a bit about SEO. <laughs> so I think that, <laughs> I, I think that this is a coin flip and you're best to answer this based on what you think the okay. capabilities of the agency are, what you think the capabilities of your internal person are and what you, how you would devise resource allocation and time allocation across separate channels based on your perceived upside of those different channels and how they fit into your mix. And so I don't think that's a question that I can answer for you, right? I could say it's the agency and then the agency sucks. And then, or mm -hmm. I could say, go with the internal person and the internal person is not very great. And so um, I think it's, this is totally situation, um, situation dependent. Um, something um are you doing outbound sales yes how's that yeah. going that's all the guys are doing and it's mm -hmm. not now that i now that i get the opportunities because outbound sales is pretty um needs improvement mm. <laughs> got it we're in, a, we're in a stage now where we want growth you know so that's we just had a big sort of get together with the company all about growth how do we grow this mm -hmm. business um and you know we we obviously got some agreement around the board about, you know, we need to be investing more in the marketing team as well as just marketing in general, which is good. But now it's kind of, all right, what do you need? And, and what's your strategy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think what you put forward could work. I'll offer an alternative that might be interesting to consider as well. And so like, if it was me, how, how many people work at your company? 
Um, overall, it's about 60 people. We're very, yeah. we're sort of operations heavy. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So if it was me at 60 people and it's been mainly outbound up to this point, like what I'm doing is I'm running highly targeted LinkedIn ads to high value accounts. I'm producing a podcast and I'm building a community around yeah. the, the topic or narrative that I want to, that I want people to be a part of. And those are the three things. And I'm going all in on that. I'm hiring experts that are good at those specific things um, to do them. And I'm forgetting everything else. And I'm going to let those three things roll. And that's sort of just, that's my marketing style um, is very deep and, and just basically like the North star for me right now, from the, the first couple of times that I posted on LinkedIn to still to this day is put the best content for B2B marketing on LinkedIn in the world. That's my goal. And so if you're going to go into a channel as a marketer, I would encourage you to think about it through that mindset. And so then you can narrow it off. Right. So I want to build the best community for this specific set of people in the world or in, you know, wherever you're located or however, however you decide to segment it off, you can narrow it in where it's actually achievable. Um, and that becomes sort of like the North star. And then you just have two or three things. I, I work with a lot of SaaS companies. I spend a lot of time in their Salesforce instance. Most companies have one, two or three marketing tactics that are actually driving results. And a lot of them don't know how to look to know exactly which ones those are. And so that's, uh, I think that's a, an insight for people as well is like, you don't need a million different things running to really drive growth. You need one thing that is working really well, ideally more than one over time. If you have one, like you can build on top, right? So my LinkedIn, we were single channel at the beginning. It was only LinkedIn. And then over time it was podcast events, email, and we've continued to expand out for there. And so it's not that you shouldn't do some of the things that I didn't mention. It's that you should stay focused at the beginning in making two or three things work very well. As it starts to work, the company starts to grow. You get more budget. You start running growth experiments. You add a different layer and a different layer over time. And then you continuously audit the two, three, four, five, six things that you have going on. You prioritize them or sort them based on what the perceived impact is or what the measurable impact is. And if there are things at the bottom that are not having a measurable impact anymore, then you consider cutting them off to make room for something else. And I think I'll just add there, Nuam, to go back to your original question. I think you should think about what is the strategy that you want to deploy? And it should be focused and, and, and uh, prioritizing the things that are gonna drive the most impact. And then you figure out once your strategy, what are my internal resources and which of those can I line up for that strategy? And then where are the gaps? And then am I gonna fill those gaps by an external partner, a new hire? Like, so just think about it like strategy, internal assessment of what you have, and then you can fill the gaps in a lot of different ways. And so maybe just approaching the problem in that way can also help you. It's less about like, should I outsource SEO to an agency? And it's more like, what am I gonna do? What are my internal capabilities? What are the gaps? How am I gonna fill those gaps? And so maybe thinking about it in that way can help you break down what your best next steps might be. Yeah, I like that. Thank you guys. Um, we have, I think, a new person to come on and ask a question. Forgive me, Yvonne, if you've asked one live before, but I'm bringing you on next. No, it's um, my first time here. Um, hey, welcome. Welcome here. Hi. Glad to have you. Yeah, so um, I'm just someone who sort of fell into the marketing role. I started as an analyst at the company. And so something I really want to know is like, can someone who doesn't have, you know, authority, um, but is still a subject matter expert, can they still create content? Will anyone listen to that if, you know, they're not C-suite or they don't have like connections that matter? Should they still be creating content or should I really just push for someone who is like an SME to just get on there and create content? Like try to really make them see why it matters. I don't think that it's, about title, I think that just strictly the way that it is, having a more senior title tends to work better. It's not, it's not right or wrong. It's just the things that I see, but I don't think it's a requirement. There are, it, it depends on from your buyer's perspective, 
does the buyer trust you, think you're credible and listen, and listen to you, right? And so for companies that sell to SDRs, they have SDRs that are producing content that SDRs like that creates a lot of awareness that then leads SDRs to surfacing that to their manager and buying $100,000 software. And so I think there are, it's, it, it, you need to look at it through the eyes of your buyer, right? So at the, be, at the beginning for me, when I was on my journey, and by the way, like I kind of fell into marketing too, and I'm pumped about it. So I'm pumped for you. Um, but when I, in 2013, like if I was producing content for CMOs, trying to sell them services where I didn't have any experience and didn't have a lot of the skills that I have today, just not a lot of the CMOs would have, would have listened to what I have to say. Right. And so over time you build up that amount of credibility to a level, but you're never going to really know until you do it. And so I think that it's worth, I think that it's worth a shot. And then it's just making sure that you are able to, um, to like understand whether or not it's working aside from just the measurables, because the measurable measurables might mislead you. I'll give you another um, another idea, which I've done in the past, which I think will work for you, which is that at the beginning, um, at a company, the subject matter expert didn't want to produce the content and didn't want to be on the podcast or anything like that. But I believed in the strategy. And so I was going to put that on, but I wasn't going to be the expert. I was going to be the interviewer of experts and the experts that I were going to, I was going to get were external. And so I would go out, who's your buyer? Um, big like grocery and retail. Who in, who inside of it? I think we're really targeting like C-suite people like CTO just to like get into the tech because they're the decision makers. Cool. Um, so first off, I would challenge you. I mean, it depends on, I, I could be wrong here, but I believe that a lot of those decisions get made under C-suite. People just think that it's the C-suite that makes the decision. And so... Um, something to consider, but I would look at the the management level below the CTO. Who are those people? Who is ultimately responsible for what you're trying to do? Who is that job? Who is that job title? And then start bringing those people onto your podcast where you interview them. You get smarter. You understand the buyers more deeply through the process of doing that. So it's market research. You also get to put out content from experts that people might like. And so I think that's the, the strategy that I've used when I didn't have a subject matter expert and I definitely wasn't one either. Right, thank you. I mean, I think um, you become like the subject matter expert when you start doing these interviews and things like that. So I think that's what I mean. Totally, for. and yeah, this one, it, it depends on your buyer, right? For a, for a CTO, like it doesn't, it, it could be me or you. If I went out and did 20 podcasts with CTOs, it wouldn't make me make CTOs want to listen to me, right? When I was doing mine, it was with, you know, neonatal intensive care unit physicians, neonatologists that take care of premature babies that are like need to, that might die and they need to save them, right? And so that's who I was interviewing. No matter how many podcasts I did and how many interviews, neonatologists still would not find me credible. I didn't have credentials. I didn't have experience all those different things. And that's just the, it's not good or bad. It's just the reality. And so you, you build insights that allow you to guide strategy, but may not, you ultimately may never become the expert for that specific buyer. But the key for you, especially where you are in your career is learning the process of how to do that. And then you learn the process for how to interview CTOs and get them on the podcast and post-produce the content and distribute it on email and LinkedIn and media. And then once you understand that, you might be able to talk about that to marketers and marketers would find you credible. Great, perfect. Thank you so much. Happy to help. Thanks for coming tonight. Great question. Glad we could bring you on live. Mm -hmm. Kind of got through all the questions. You said you had a lot of thoughts going around in your head. You want to oh close this out with a little, a little rant, a little Chris Walker rant. We could all use one before we uh, go to bed tonight. Oh no! <laughs> or Jess gets her morning coffee <laughs> in the future, because mm. it's Wednesday morning, right? <laughs> in Australia. Uh, Gosh. Or I can tell you about the trip I'm taking to LA next week to see my family.
Well, um, maybe maybe we'll just <laughs> <laughs> we'll save everyone for the trip. Maybe we'll just kind of close this out one soft way. I was looking through my typically I got stuff in my notebook where it's just like things that happened throughout my day that I thought was interesting that might I might want to talk to, but um, I don't have much. So we will. Uh, it's like funny that I'm about to say we'll end early tonight, but it's <laughs> been 75 minutes since we started, and so appreciate having you all on here. Hope to see. Hope to see some of your faces, maybe not the people in Australia because of the time difference, but hope to see some of you on the, the 12.30 um, p.m. time slot for next Thursday. So we'll have a double feature of Demand Gen Live next week. Um, and uh, yeah, really appreciate having you all here and look forward to seeing you again soon. Have a good night, guys. Hey, everyone. Have a great night. Bye.